Believe it or not, I was 12 years old the first time I went to Disneyland. Now, I know there are some of you sitting here who are surprised that Disneyland even existed that long ago. <laughs> Do you know how I got into the park that day? My dad purchased my entry ticket for me. It was a good thing he did, too, because you see, if he had just led me up to the entry gate and then said, there you go, son, go buy yourself a ticket, you can go on in and spend the day in Disneyland and hang out with all of the characters and do the rides and the rest of it. If he hadn't have purchased that ticket for me, I'd have been standing outside all day long, just looking forlornly at Mickey and Goofy <laughs> and the Matterhorn and all of the rest of it. See, the price of that ticket to get into Disneyland was way beyond my means at the time. I could not afford an entry ticket into Disneyland when I was 12 years old. I mean, I can barely afford a ticket into Disneyland now. We're continuing a series of Bible studies called Crossing Paths with Jesus, in which we are looking at stories from the life of Jesus when he crosses paths with others and the impact that those intersections have on their lives. Last time, we looked at the story of when an expert in the Jewish religious law came up to Jesus and he asked him which commandment he considered to be the most important. And Jesus told him that the most important commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second most important commandment, Jesus said, is to love your neighbor as yourself. These two commandments sum up the whole law of God. If we did these two things consistently, love God and love others, it would transform our lives and it would transform the world, wouldn't it? Well, today we're going to look at a conversation that Jesus had with a young man who appeared to have everything going for him, but he still felt empty inside. He had tried to carefully check all of the boxes in his life, but he was still missing something. He comes to Jesus to get insight and answers. And what Jesus tells him blows up the whole set of rules that he had been living his life by. Now, before we get into this main story, though, we're going to take a look at the little story that occurs just before it. What Jesus teaches us in this little story helps us understand what he's teaching us in the bigger story that follows. See, although these two stories on the surface have no obvious connection with one another, the common truth that is taught in them is what links them together. So let's flip over to Mark chapter 10. And we'll start taking a look at the story in verse 13. So it's Mark chapter 10, verse 13. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. So people are bringing their babies and small children to Jesus to have him lay his hands on them and to bless them. The disciples, though, are trying to stop the people from doing it. The text says that they rebuke the people. They're telling them sternly to stop bringing their children to Jesus. The general view of children in those days was different from our own day. Although children were loved by their parents, they had no rights, no status, no voice, no power, no influence. They were the property of their parents. And knowing this helps us to better understand the disciples' attitude in this story towards the parents bringing their kids. The disciples, see, they, they have good intentions at heart. They're trying to protect Jesus' time so his effort and his attention can be given to more important things. The disciples see this whole baby blessing Thing as an interruption, a distraction from more weighty and important things for Jesus to be spending his time on. You see, 
For them, Jesus has real diseases to heal, real demons to free people from, important truths to teach everyone about the kingdom of God, powerful and influential people to interact with. But they're about to discover that they don't understand the heart of Jesus and his mission nearly as well as they think they do. In verse 14, it says, But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant, and he said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms, and he blessed them, laying his hands on them. So how does Jesus react to the, to the disciples trying to prevent the little children from coming to him? It says Jesus is indignant. He's not at all happy with the attitude of the disciples and what they're doing. See, the disciples, they had rebuked the people about bringing their children to Jesus, and Jesus in turn rebukes them for trying to stop the people from bringing their children to him. Jesus has a very different understanding about who and what is important. The prevailing understanding of the day saw children as powerless and unimportant. That meant that they were to take their place at the back of the line. Little children didn't have power or resources to further Jesus' career, to spread his cause, to fund his vision. They had nothing to offer of any tangible value. Jesus, he purposely sought out people who were shunned and ignored by others. He healed the blind, the crippled, the leprous, the demon-possessed. He interacted with the Samaritan half-breed, the prostitute, the vile tax collector, and he gave time and attention to little children. There are no overlooked, ignored, avoided people in the kingdom of God. All are invited, no matter how small or insignificant others may think you are. As Horton said, a person's a person, no matter how small. <laughs> Jesus goes further, though, and says, For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Well, what does Jesus mean by that? What about little children is Jesus referring to? Well, he's not saying that we're to be childish, throwing ourselves on the floor and kicking and screaming because we don't get our way. That's not what he says. He's not saying we're to be self-centered, unwilling to share our toys with others. That's not what he's saying. He's talking instead about the simple trust and the humble dependence a little child has on those who love her. When Jesus tells us to receive the kingdom of God like a little child, he's referring to this simple trust that a small child has in her parents' love and provision for her. Jesus wants us to see that we can't earn our place in the kingdom of God any more than a little child can earn her way into her family. When a baby is born, dad and mom don't say, now prove your worth to us and we'll consider keeping you. <laughs> they don't say, you need to pull your own weight in this family or we're getting you right out the door. They don't expect him to go out and get a job to contribute to the family income. Instead, mom and dad, they welcome that precious little one into the family, and they love her, and they care for her, doing whatever is necessary to make sure she's safe and secure and has what she needs to grow. A properly loved child doesn't fret and worry about whether dad and mom love her, if they're going to keep her, feed her, give her a place to sleep, clothe her. She doesn't go around frantically trying to prove her worthiness to be in the family. She's confident and she's secure in their love for her. She assumes all of those things. She trusts in her parents' love for her. She has to trust her parents' love for her. She can't provide for herself 
any of the stuff that she needs for survival. It's all way beyond her ability and know-how and means. She's completely dependent on her parents for everything. She trusts in her parents for everything. Jesus said, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Your heavenly Father loves you, and he is inviting you up into his arms, little one. The amazing, generous grace of God is laid out before us in both this story and the next one. Entering the kingdom of God is more costly and difficult than any of us can imagine. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. We can't buy it. It's completely out of reach for us. How then are we to enter the kingdom of God? To receive salvation? To have eternal life? We have to receive it like a little kid from our Heavenly Father. This next story teaches this same truth. Entrance into the kingdom of God is not something that we can earn or deserve. It's something that we receive with childlike trusting faith. Verse 17. It says, And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So this man who runs up to Jesus... He's called young in Matthew's account of this incident. He's referred to as a ruler in Luke's account. And we learn later in Mark's account here that he has great wealth. So this man is often called a rich, young ruler. He has everything going for him, materially speaking. He has wealth. He has power. He has importance. And he's still young enough to enjoy it all. I mean, for most, when we're young, we don't have enough money or power to do much of anything other than survive. And when we finally do have enough money and power, well, we're too old to enjoy it then, aren't we? Well, this guy is a rare person who has it all and he's young enough to enjoy it. Well, in spite of all that this man has going for him, he is still lacking something in his life. The deep emptiness of the human soul, it can't be filled with wealth or power or fame or anything else that this life has to offer. He runs up to Jesus and he asks him what he must do to inherit eternal life. In other words, he wants to know how to be saved, how to enter the kingdom of God, how to obtain lasting peace and fulfillment, how to go to heaven. See, these are all ways of expressing the same deep desire in the human heart for relationship with God. This is one of the most important questions for us to seek an answer to in this life. Some people avoid this question. They purposely fill their life with distractions to keep the question from ever bubbling to the top so that they never have to face it. But we should seek the answer to this question because we are all going to want to know the answer to this question eventually. All of us. We're all going to face tragedy and death, whether our own or that of loved ones. This question about salvation and eternal life is going to come up for every single one of us. But we can see from the way that this young man asks the question that he's thinking in terms of something that he can do to earn or deserve eternal life. This is the common thinking of most people in our day too. And it makes sense from that perspective. Everything worth having costs something. And something as important and amazing as eternal life has got to cost a great deal. So what does a person have to do to earn it? Well, here's the situation that we're faced with. Eternal life costs way more than any of us could ever afford. It's simply too expensive. 
and we're all grossly underqualified. Eternal life is unattainable for all of us. The only way for any of us to ever enter into eternal life, to enter into the kingdom of God, to have salvation, is if it's given to us as a gift from God. We're dependent on our Heavenly Father for eternal life, like a little child is dependent on her parents for life. Eternal life has to be received with that simple, unassuming trust of a little child. Verse 18, And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So Jesus, he challenges this young man's point of view on life and his belief system about what makes a person good. See, when we get further into the story and this conversation that Jesus has with him, we discover that this young man, he believes that he's been a good person, that he is a good person. You know, most people, they believe they're basically a good person. If I were to go out and talk to just random people on the street and ask them if they think they are basically a good person, almost everyone is going to answer me with a yes. Almost everyone thinks they are basically a good person. Well, Jesus wants this man to realize that the goodness required for eternal life is beyond his reach. Only God is good enough. Only God is good enough. The only human ever good enough was God the Son, Jesus, who became a human to die for us and credit his goodness to us. When this young man calls Jesus good, he doesn't really realize the truth that he has just spoken about Jesus. Jesus says, you know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. So Jesus answers the young man's question about how to obtain eternal life using the same set of rules that this young man has been living his life by. Jesus gives a condensed summary of the Old Testament law. The Jewish people believed that a person who kept the Old Testament commandments would enter eternal life. Many people in our own day essentially believe the same thing. To get to heaven, you have to follow the the Ten Commandments and be a good person. Jesus is going to blow that idea up. Verse 20. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. So the young man, he replies that he's kept all the commandments. Since childhood, he's he's been a good person. And I believe this young man is sincere in his answer to Jesus. He's not bragging about how good he is. He's saying, I've tried to live a morally good life. I've fulfilled all of the religious obligations expected of me. I go to synagogue. I honor the Sabbath. I don't cheat people. I don't lie. I don't steal. I don't gossip. I've tried to do the right thing and be a good person all my life. But I know there's something more. I know I lack something. I I know I'm still falling short. I know in my heart of hearts that I have not done enough to earn my way to heaven. I still feel guilty and dirty inside. I still feel alienated from God. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. It says in Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Jesus recognizes this man's sincere longing and struggle. Jesus looks right into his heart and he knows him. Jesus has the same kind of insightful compassion for each of us. Jesus sees into your heart. 
He knows what drives us. He knows about our insecurities. He sees through our cover-ups. He loves us in, in the midst of the poverty of our soul. He looks at us and he loves us. Jesus puts his finger right on the sensitive spot for this man. He tells him to go and sell all that he has and give it to the poor and then follow Jesus. Jesus knows what he's really trusting in at the foundation of his life. He he knows where he gets his sense of security and self-worth. Jesus, he essentially just strips the cover off of his life to show him that earning eternal life is beyond his ability. Will he understand that and then continue to seek after Jesus for the answer to that dilemma? Or will he continue to try to pull himself up by his own bootstraps? Verse 22 answers that question for us. It says, disheartened by the saying, He went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So he goes away very sad and discouraged. Jesus has asked him to do something that he can't do, something that he's not willing to do. If we're honest, we too find this request of Jesus too hard to do. There may be a few among us who would be willing to do this, But not many, not many of us. See, we can try to put this guy at a safe distance and think how sad it is that he's unwilling to give away everything that he has and give it away to the poor and follow Jesus. But who here, who here would really be willing to do that? Not many. The point behind Jesus telling him to sell all that he had and give it to the poor was to show him and his disciples and us that none of us, none of us are willing and able to really do all that's required to inherit eternal life, to enter the kingdom of God, to be saved, to go to heaven. See, people who judge this guy for being unwilling to give away everything that he has, they're missing the point of the story. And they're being dishonest about their own inability and unwillingness to do what's necessary to enter the kingdom of God. You see, maybe money and possessions are not your hang-up. There's something in your life, though, that is just as big of a hang-up Something that is a deal breaker for you too. And if you'd been in the same place as this guy, I can assure you that Jesus would have called you out on whatever that deal breaker is for you. And you would have faced the same kind of crisis that this man does about whether you're going to go away sad and discouraged or you are going to lean harder into Jesus, trusting in him rather than yourself. See, that's what's going on here. Verse 23, And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And his disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? The disciples are amazed at Jesus' pronouncement that it's hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. They are even more amazed. They are exceedingly astonished, it says, when Jesus suggests that it's impossible. 
Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Well, let me ask you, how hard would it be to fit a full, a real full-grown, full-sized camel through the eye of a little sewing needle? It would be really hard, wouldn't it? In fact, it would be impossible if you want to have a living, breathing camel when you're done. <laughs> because the only way I can think to get a camel through the eye of a needle would be to make the camel into a very fine soup first. <laughs> In that culture, wealth was believed to be evidence of God's blessing on a person. And that's why the disciples are so shocked by what Jesus says here. Not only is this man wealthy, which was seen as a sign of God's blessing, but he's also what everyone would have considered a good person. So the disciples' reasoning went something like this. If a decent person like this who obviously has the blessing of God upon his life, can't enter the kingdom of God, then what's to become of the rest of us? I mean, how can anyone be saved? And I think when they asked that question, Jesus said, now you're getting it. Now you're starting to get it. How can anyone be saved? Verse 27, Jesus looked at them and said, With man, it's impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Jesus now gives the solution to this apparent unsolvable problem of how any human being can ever enter the kingdom of God, can ever be saved, can ever go to heaven, can ever have eternal life. What's impossible for human beings is possible with God. See, salvation is a work of God. It has to be. It has to be. Because it's impossible for human beings to do it in their own effort. Even the very best among us can't pull it off. Jesus said in Mark 10, 15, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Your heavenly Father loves you so much. Through Jesus, he's inviting you to come and receive eternal life. He's paid the price. He's bought the ticket for you. He's saying, come in. Come in. See, and as long as we keep trying to earn it, to deserve it, to buy it, we'll be frustrated and discouraged. But you, because we can't do it. Receive it like a little child. Receive it like a little child. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this amazing reminder and offer that you give to us to simply receive like a little child from you. The thing that we keep trying to get on our own, to earn, to deserve, to prove our worthiness of, is <laughs> something that's so far beyond us. It's, it's ridiculous that we would even think that we could pull it off. And you say, 
come. Receive. Be my child. Put your trust in what my son, Jesus, has done. I pray for every single person here this morning, Lord. Those who have never received from you before, I pray that today is the day that they receive, that today is the day they go, I, I want what Jesus has done to be mine. His life, his death, his resurrection. I put my faith in Jesus, and I'm going to follow him. I pray that today is the day they do that. For those of us who have done that, I, I pray, God, that you would remind us and encourage us that we're your kids. We're not a slave. We're not a hired hand. We're not an employee. We're your sons and daughters. always and forever. Help us to open our hands and to receive from you, Lord, and to continue to receive from you. Encourage every single person here today. In Jesus' name, amen.